In this video, we will be covering section 1.2. Um, to begin with, in section 1.1, to motivate this whole new topic of limits, uh, we were looking at finding the slope of a tangent line and finding the instantaneous rate of change. Um, we came across expressions that we needed to uh, not evaluate at a specific number, but determine what, what the output of the, of the expression was getting closer to as my inputs got closer and closer to a specific number. That's the whole idea of a limit. And we found those limits using tables and using graphs. Um, and we we're going to want to do that a little quicker. Um, and we want to do that analytically and move away from the tables and graphs. And so that's what we're learning in section 1.2, how to um, work with uh, just the variables. So um, our approach is uh, going to be to uh, come up with a, a couple of very basic limits, very intuitive, uh, and then from there, some very intuitive results, some limit laws, and then from there, um, we will go over how to use the limit laws to uh, calculate the, uh, the, the more difficult limits. We begin here. Uh, for the function f of x equals 5, find the limit as x goes to 4 of f of x, the limit as x goes to negative 3 of f of x, the limit as x goes to a of f of x. Okay, so in this particular uh, example, we're dealing with the constant function f of x equals 5. And what that means is no matter what your input is, your output is always 5. Um, so I will do the first one. And then you should try and do the other two. So I will do the first one after you see the per first one. Pause the video and um, attempt to do the other two. Okay, so um, again, what you need to get comfortable with is understanding what you're being asked, right? So you're being asked to find the limit as x approaches 4 of f of x, which is asking, as my inputs get closer and closer to 4, what should the outputs tend to? What should they tend to. Um, so we went over a couple ways of doing that. One way of doing that is to graph my function. Um, so again, this is the limit as x goes to 4 of f of x, but f of x is always 5. So we can just replace the f of x with 5. So this becomes the limit as x goes to 4 of the constant 5. Uh, the, the function f of x equals 5 is a line, horizontal line. You should know that from pre-calculus. Same thing as y equals 5. f of x is another way of writing y. And it crosses the y-axis right here at a y value of 5. And so 4 is right here. And what I'm really asking is, if I were walking on this graph, getting closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer, and closer uh, to a x value of 4, what is my y value tending to? Well, since my uh, y value is always 5, that's the graph I'm on, y equals 5, kind of makes sense that the answer should be 5. You could also look at it from a table, from a table, from a numerical view, x f of x, your table should um, have inputs that get closer and closer to a value of 4. And so we'll start at 3, then 3.9, then 3.99, then 3.999. And, uh, but my output is always 4. I'm sorry, my output is always 5, because that's my function. It's, it's the constant function 5. 5, 5, 5. So, it should make sense then that this limit of b5. Now, if you are going to make a numeric, I'm sorry, a numerical argument, and you are going to make a table, remember that your table really should include um, approaching your input value from both sides. This table here, uh, the numbers are just approaching being less than uh, four. Now we want to be more than four, starting at five then 4.1, then 4.001. Remember that we're approaching 4. Limit as x goes to 4. But your output is always 5. 
because it's the constant function five. And so your limit is five. Now pause the video and try the other two. We're in both of these problems. Uh, I'm sorry, in all of these problems, f of x is the constant function five. Okay, so again, um, after you saw the first one, um, you really can just write down the answer. You can go and you can make a table if you like to remind yourself of what you were doing. You're asking, as my inputs approach negative 3, so we'll start at negative 4, uh, then negative 3.1, then negative 3.01, then negative 3.00, One, my outputs are always five. I'm sorry, my um, out, yeah, my outputs are always five, and so it should make sense that this be five. You can look at that graph. Negative three is over here, and as I walk towards an x value of negative three, if I keep track of my y values, they're always five. So, what should I be tending to? I should be tending to five, and so there we are. My limit is 5. Okay, now for this third one. Uh, now, instead of negative 3 or 4, we have A. A is a generic number. You can put it wherever you like. I will put it over here. And as I walk getting closer and closer and closer and closer to an x value of A, my y values are always 5. So it should make sense that my limit is 5. Okay, so based off of this example, um, go ahead and uh, try these. Pause the video, try these problems, and uh, then resume the video and see if you did them right. Okay, so we want to find the limit as x approaches 2 of the function of the constant function whose output is always negative 4. Well, if your output is always negative 4, then it should make sense that your limit is negative 4. Here the constant function is 12. No matter what you put in for x, your function has an output of 12. So as you put in numbers that get closer and closer to 12, uh, your outputs will tend... I'm sorry, that get closer and closer to a, your outputs will tend to 12. Here you have a constant uh, value of k. It has nothing to do with x. Uh, this is your input variable right here. This has no x in it, so we're assuming that that k does not change. So your output is always k. So as your input tends to a, your output is always going to be k. If you want to see a graph of that, the function, what you are walking on, is the horizontal line y equals k. There's the x-axis, there's the y-axis, and there's... Okay, and as you uh, approach, let's say that is A, as you approach an X value of A, you're walking on here and you're keeping track of your Y value, but your Y value is always K, so your Y value is tending towards K. Okay, so based on these, it's very intuitive that um, the limit as X approaches A of any constant will just be K. Right. So when you come across these limits, just as in this exercise up here, there's no work to show. You could draw graphs, you could make tables, but there's absolutely no need. It's very intuitive. Anytime you see a limit that looks like this, where what you're look, taking the limit of is this constant function, and your answer is just k. Let's move on to a slightly more complicated problem. Right. So here, for the function f of x equals x, Find the limit as x approaches 4 of f of x. Three problems here. I will do one. You should pause the video and then um, try the other two. Okay. So just to get you comfortable with the notation, f of x is x. So we can rewrite this as the limit as x approaches 4 of x. Okay, so again... Um, if you wanted to look at this numerically, uh, this is the identity function, f of x equals x. What that means is whatever your input is, is that's what your output is. 
So we're taking the limit as x approaches 4, x, f of x. But your output is very simple. Whatever your input was, that's your output. So we want to do 3, then 3.9, then 3.99, then 3.999. And um, now my inputs are tending towards 4, and the question is, what are the outputs tending to? Well, your outputs are the same. 3, 3.9. 3.99 they're the same as your inputs so 3.999 so it should make sense that um, if your inputs are tending towards uh, 4 and your outputs are the same as your inputs because that's what this function is it's the identity function then your limit should be 4 you can look at this from a graph uh, now if you're going to make a table then um, you should um, you should also do it from the other side, right? So x, f of x, and then um, you can do 5, then 4.1, then 4.01, then 4.001. And so then again, f of x equals x means that you get 5, 4.1, 4.01, 4.001 your outputs I'm sorry your inputs are tending towards 4 and your outputs are the same so your outputs are always also tending towards 4 so your limit is 4 you could have looked at this graphically uh, the line y, y equals x is a line and what's important about this line is that the y coordinate for every point on this line is the same as the x coordinate that's what it says y equals x so the point corresponding to an x value of 4 is the point up here that also corresponds to a y value of 4 so that point is on the line and again graphically what I'm asking when I'm asking what is the limit as x approaches 4 if I walk getting closer and 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 closer to an x value of 4 what is the y value tending to so these y values on these points are tending to this y value right here, 4. If that's just on the left. You should also look at it on the right. If I walk getting closer and closer and closer and closer, I'm still walking towards the same point, and I'm walking towards 4. So the limit is 4. We should pause the video and um, do the other uh, two problems and then um, come back. So um, again, in this problem here is asking for this function f of x equals x, what it are my outputs tending to as my inputs tend to negative 3? So if my formula is the limit as, uh, I'm sorry, if my formula is f of x equals x, I can just rewrite this as the limit as x goes to negative 3 of just x. And all this is asking is if I put in values that get closer and closer to negative 3 into this formula, what will my outputs tend to? Well, whatever number I put out, put in, that is the same number I get out. So if I put in numbers that get closer and closer to negative 3, your outputs should get closer and closer to negative 3. Okay. That should make sense. No work to show, no need, unless I ask you to make a table or I ask you to look at a graph. You don't have to. Um, because uh, these problems are fairly intuitive. So on problems like this, I just expect you to be able to write down the answer. So again, this is the limit as x approaches a, and your function in this problem is just x. And uh, you're putting in numbers that get closer and closer to a. Your formula is just this x, so whatever you put in, that's the same thing you get out. And as you put in numbers that get closer and closer to a, your output should get closer and closer to a. And there you go. So a result. Anytime you have this limit, the limit as x goes to a of just x, and that seems intuitively obvious that the answer should be a. Okay. Um, so now we have now we're working with the function one over x, and this is the reciprocal function. So this is um, what you're doing here. 
is you are um, finding the reciprocal of your input. Reciprocals are numbers that multiply together to make one. And so um, you should know what this graph looks like uh, from pre-calculus. And this graph is a hyperbola. And we're only interested in um, near zero. And so your graph looks like this. Um, and so we'll get back to that graph in just a little bit. We could also look at this using a table. X, 1 over X. And again, we're taking the limit as X goes to 0 from the left. So that means we want to use numbers that are less than 0. Um, so then we can start at negative 1. And so then to figure out your Y value, um, your Y value is 1 divided by negative 1. And one way of thinking of 1 divided by negative 1 is by asking yourself, negative 1 times what? Give you positive 1. And so the answer is negative 1. And you can check that because when you multiply this one by this one, you get that one. Right? And so that is how you can check your, your answer. And so that's correct. So you get negative 1. But we want to get closer to 0. So we'll do negative 1 tenth. And again, 1 divided by negative 1 tenth. And again, what you are asking is, what do I multiply by? What do I multiply negative 1 tenth by to get a y value of 1? So it's 1 tenth. So 10 times 1 tenth, the tens will cancel out. But we would have a negative and a positive, and we'd end up with a negative. So it's got to be negative 10. And you can check that, because if you multiply this one times this one, you get that one. And so your answer is negative 10. So we're trying to get closer to 0. So we'll go negative 1 hundredth. And again, it's 1 divided by negative 1 hundredth. And again, it's what do I multiply by? What do I multiply negative 1 hundredth by to make 1? So negative 1 hundredth times what will make 1? It's 1 hundredth. So if I use 100 and then make a negative so I get a positive, when I multiply this one times this one, I will get this one. And so the answer is negative 100. Don't need a calculator. You should avoid using your calculator when possible. By choosing these values, um, I can see, uh, I can do it in my head. Don't need the calculator, it makes it a little quicker. Uh, now that brings up the problem, does it matter what values you use? Well, we'll do one more and then we'll go over that, right? So we'll try negative 1,000. And again, what do I multiply by negative 1,000th to get 1? And so then that has to be negative 1,000. And you can see that it doesn't matter which numbers I use, that uh, it's always going to be asking, what do I multiply by to make 1? And so as these numbers get smaller and smaller, these numbers over here have to uh, decrease without bound. And so you might remember that that is what you um, uh, learned in pre-calculus about this uh, function, is that as you approach zero, your function has a vertical asymptote. And so now we can describe using vertical asymptotes, um, I'm sorry, we can describe vertical asymptotes using uh, limits. So if the limit as x approaches a specific number, increases or decreases without bound, then you have a vertical asymptote. In this case, this decreases without bound, and so what we say is that this limit is negative infinity. On the graph, what that means is there's negative one, you end up here. There's one-tenth, you end up down here. At one-hundredth, you end up way down here. At one-thousandth, you end up farther down. At one-hundredth-thousandth, you end up farther down. There's no limit to it. There's no bound to it. It just decreases without bound. 
And as you get closer and closer, as that number gets smaller and smaller to make one, you have to uh, increase the magnitude. And so that's why that's what this means. That's when you see something like that. Okay. Well, what about if we approach it from the right? Um, again, you should look at the graph. We should be comfortable with this graph. And again, you should be able to look at it from a table. At one, of course, we're going to get one. We're trying to get closer to zero using numbers that are bigger than zero, so we'll use one-tenth. And one-tenth times what will make one? Not ten. We need to get closer, so we'll use one hundred. And one-hundredth times what will make one? One hundred. And as I choose a number that gets smaller and smaller, to get back to one, my output over here needs to get bigger and bigger. And it increases without bound. So again, here at one, we were right here. At one tenth, we were up here at 10. At one hundredth, we went up to 100. At one thousandth, we went up to a thousand. So this is increasing without bound. As we get closer and closer to zero, um, I am increasing without bound. The graph has a vertical asymptote. So when your limit as x approaches a specific number of a function is either positive or negative infinity, you have a vertical asymptote. And so that is what we say here. The limit as x goes to zero from the right of f of x equals infinity. And that just means that your outputs increase without bound. There's no bound to them. And what that means is that your graph is going to have a vertical asymptote. So now we have these three limits that we're going to build on. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so here's our results from the summary of those two slides. Uh, that the limit as x goes to zero from the left of one over x is negative infinity. The limit as x goes to zero from the right of one over x is positive infinity. Um, and so um, more general, there's nothing special about the one. As long as the numerator is constant and the bottom is going to zero, that same idea is going to hold. And so if your numerator is not zero or not going to zero and your denominator is going to zero, then you um, uh, are going to uh, be going off to either positive or negative infinity from one side um, or the other, or both, uh, and then you'll have a vertical asymptote. And we'll talk more about that later. Then we can use limits to describe vertical asymptotes. Okay, but now we have these three basic results um, that whenever you have any constant, uh, your limit is that constant. Uh, whenever you're looking at the, uh, the identity function, the limit as x goes to a of just x, the limit is a. And you have these two um, uh, reciprocal limits. And so um, if we're looking at a problem like this, and this isn't quite so obvious to me. So we are quite so intuitive about what the limit should be. And what I'm asking is, as I put in numbers that get closer and closer to 3, uh, what does the output uh, tend to do? And that's not quite so obvious because that formula is kind of complicated. So rather than um, making a table or making a graph for this, because that's just going to take way too long, what we're going to do is based off of those uh, three results that we've had or four results that we've had, we're going to see how uh, some of them mix together um, to make more results. Right? So we're going to develop some limit laws and then um, use already known limits to find new limits. And that's how this is going to go, so that we don't have to keep making tables and graphs, although those are important to give you an idea of what, what it is that this means, not just how to do it. Okay, so um, let me take a moment to explain what's going on here. So we have this function. All you know is what you're being told here, that for f of x, as your input tends to 3, 
your output tends to 5. That's what this says. Right? That's how you should recognize. The limit as x goes to 3 of f of x is 5 means that for this function, as you plug in numbers that get closer and closer to 3, your outputs get closer and closer to 5. Um, and for the function g of x, as your, in, as your inputs get closer and closer to 3, your outputs tend to 7. Now, um, I'd like you to pause the video and answer the, the following four limits. What do you think the value of each is below? Right? Just use the intuition of what this means and what you're being asked to, uh, figure, out what do you, to figure out these four limits. Okay, so again, um, not, a ho not a whole lot of work to show. You know that this tends to 5. You know that this tends to 7. And all you're doing is adding the two outputs together. That's what you learned in, in pre-calculus. You can make a new function by adding two old functions together. And so then this should tend to 5 plus 7. And that's 12. And that's all this is saying, that this function, the sum function, um, tends to the sum of the two limits. It should be fairly intuitive. Again, this is tending to 5, this is tending to 7, so then the, the difference function should tend to 5 minus 7, which is negative 2. Again, this one's tending to 5, and this one is tending to 7, so the product function, where you multi you're just multiplying your two outputs, should tend to 35. And last, um, the quotient function uh, should just tend to 5 divided by 7. Fairly intuitive. Um, seems reasonable. These are the limit laws. Actually, there's one more. So here it is in a more abstraction, right? All, the, it, all this says is for this function f, as your inputs get closer and closer to a value of a, your outputs approach this number L1. And for the function g, as your inputs get closer and closer to a, your outputs approach L2. If you make a new function by adding those two functions together and you're being asked to find the limit, it should make sense then that the limit be the sum of the two limits. If the, this one's going to L1, this one's going to L1, this one's going to L2, and the sum should go to L1 plus L2. Same thing for the difference. If the limit, uh, the limit as x approaches a of the difference function f of x minus g of x should be L1 minus L2. Same thing for the product. The limit as x goes to a of the product function f of x times g of x, if this one's tending to L1 and this one's tending to L2, and you're putting in numbers that get closer and closer to a, then um, the product function should tend to L1 times L2. Uh, the limit as x goes to a of f of x divided by g of x should be L1 divided by L2 as long as L2 does not equal 0. Uh, you should put that in your notes. Um, you're not allowed to ever divide by 0. Uh, dividing by 0 is not allowed. So um, as long as it's not zero, then you're good. Uh, third one, if you're going to take the nth root of f of x, well, uh, this was still tending towards L1, and you're making this new function by just taking the nth root of your outputs. Well, if that was tending to L1, then the nth root should also tend to L1. I'm sorry, to the nth root of L1. Okay. Seems fairly intuitive. These are the limit laws, five of them. Fairly intuitive. Let's move on. Now, with the limit laws, and um, well, we know that the limit as x goes to a of the function x, we know what that is, right? So what is that? Write that down. So we know that that is a. Um, now, so how do we approach a problem like this? No need to make a table or a graph, especially since n, we don't know what n is. Um, but what we can do is realize that this x to the n can be rewritten 
still are asking what is the output approaching as my input approaches a um, and we have my function can be rewritten as x times x times x times x times x n times and what you can see now is that what you have is a product of functions each one of them being the identity function and so then the limit laws says that um, uh, since each one of these is tending to a then the product tends to a times a times a times a and there, since there was n of the x's there's n of these and so you get a to the n and so then um, rather than so so now we have uh, this result fairly intuitive not too bad nothing surprising the limit as x goes to a of x to the n is a to the n okay well how do we deal with this well again we deal with this by looking using the limit laws and looking at this function as my f looking at this function as my g the limit laws then tell me, well, what does f go to? Well, since it's a constant function, uh, it's the same constant. And from the previous slide, we know what x to the n goes to. It goes to a to the n. And so then when we have a monomial, um, when we have a simple monomial like this, the limit as x goes to a of a simple monomial like this is c times a to the n. And that's our result. No need to show any work. No need to reference the limit laws. Um, this is pretty pretty simple. These 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 types of problems, pretty simple. And now we're ready to tackle this thing, right? So no need to make a table or a graph, right? And what we have here is we have this is my f, this is my g, and instead of just having two. It should make sense that it should extend to any number of functions that you are adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing. Um, you can just look at it piece by piece, right? Now, each one of these is uh, monomial, and then we know how to. We know that this one tends to three times three squared, and that this one will tend to uh, four times three and that this one will tend to 5. Well then, when we subtract them, then this difference should tend to 3 times 3 squared minus 4 times 3. And then you add the third one, 5. And when you look at this, uh, what you realize is, hey, um, to find this limit, all I did is substitute it in for x, the 3 that I was looking at. And uh, it says uh, uh, that, is in generally, that is in general true for polynomials. Uh, to find a limit of a polynomial function, we just plug in the number. Right. And so then, um, so let's just do that. This is 27 minus 12 plus 5. Twenty-seven minus twelve is fifteen, and then plus five is twenty. I'm sorry, not twenty-five. Negative twelve plus five is eight. I'm sorry, negative twelve plus five is negative seven. Negative seven and twenty-seven is twenty. And so we have this result. No need to do tables or graphs. When we see a polynomial function, um, you get your limit by simply plugging it in. This is how you do the problem. But you should also try to keep in mind always what you're being asked to do. What you're being asked to do when you're taking a limit as x goes to a of p of x, you're being asked what is the output getting closer and closer to. And what this is telling you 
is it's getting closer and closer to whatever it is that you put, uh, whatever your output is, if you put in the number. Right? Seems fairly intuitive, fairly uh, not a problem, very easy. Um, okay, so go ahead and pause the video and do this problem. Right, so you can do this problem using the limit laws and what we've just gone over. So you should go ahead and do this problem. Okay. Okay, well, if you look, the numerator is a polynomial and the denominator is a polynomial. So what the limit laws tell you is um, all I have to do is figure out what does this tend to and figure out what does this tend to and then divide the two. But because these are polynomials, to figure out what they tend to, we just plug them in. So when we plug them in, um, we get 4 squared. Minus 16. Divided by 4 squared. Plus 4 plus 5 which is 0 divided by 25. Now again, um, what you're asking is 25 times what will make 0? And that's 0. Nothing wrong with dividing into 0. Um, if you have 0 apples and 25 people, how much does each one get? You can do that. Each one gets nothing because there is nothing to be divided. And so that is your limit. So now um, there's a, what we're going to need to be able to do is we're going to need to be able to factor. And um, for those of you who have uh, difficulty factoring with complicated expressions, here's a very um, useful result from pre-calculus. Uh, for a polynomial function, x equals a is a 0 implies the polynomial has a factor of x minus a. What it means to be a zero is when you plug that in to your polynomial, you get zero. Uh, what it means for a to be a zero is that p of a is equal to zero. Which means when you plug in a, you get zero. Notice that if p of x is x minus a, then p of a is a minus a, which is zero. So if you have a polynomial function, and a makes it 0, x minus a has to be a factor. Right? And so that's going to help you factors because then you will know what one of those factors is. One of the factors is has to be x minus a. Very common for people to, uh, to want to, it's just intuitive for them, that if a is a 0, then x plus a is a factor. So if p of x is x plus a, uh, then um, P of A would be A plus A, which is 2A, which is not necessarily 0. So that, that doesn't work. It's not a plus. It's a minus. Whatever number it is that makes it 0, X minus that number is a factor. Okay. So let's move on. <coughs> so find the limit as x approaches 4, 12x squared minus 55x plus 28, all divided by x minus 4. Okay, so um, when we want to find the limit as x goes to 4 of this rational function, um, we can figure out what the numerator is tending to, we can figure out what the denominator is tending to, and then divide those two together. Um, because this is a polynomial, to figure out what it's tending to, we just plug it in. So this goes to 0, because 4 minus 4 is 0. Uh, in the numerator, 12 times 16 minus 55 times uh, 4 plus 28. 12 times 16 is 192. 55 times 4 is 220 and then plus 28 
and then um, when you plug that in you get zero and so your answer is zero divided by zero um, and so then again you need to be careful with zero divided by zero zero times what will give you zero and you might say hey it's zero but five also works so it is ten so it is negative eight every number works because no matter what you put over here zero times that number will give you that number and so um, we don't like problems where we get more than one answer especially not if we get infinitely many answers and so again this is just a reminder this is not defined um, so you can only do this you can only apply the limit laws if the denominator is not tending towards zero which here it was okay so then you might be tempted to um, okay well let's go back and see what the uh, graph looks like Okay, so let's go to y equals, um, let's hit clear, and then um, what we have is parentheses 12x, I forgot the 2, 12x squared minus 55x x plus 28 that's all that's in the numerator and we are dividing it by x minus 4 start here in the zoom six and um, what we can see here is that um, this kind of looks like a line but it's awfully very steep we're looking at what is it tending to as x approaches four one two three four it's way up here so we got to change our window and because it's so steep um, we're going to go ahead and leave the x values the same um, but our y values will go negative 100 and positive 100 and see what that looks like. And what you're noticing is that this looks a lot like a line, right? Um, so it looks just like a line, which is kind of strange because um, our graph was a rational function. Um, 4 made it 0, and you remember that um, sometimes numbers that made the denominator 0 uh, gave you a vertical asymptote, like we saw on the 1 over x. Your, your values would tend towards infinity, but this one doesn't have that. Um, also, um, but the reason why this one doesn't have that is because 4 also made the numerator 0. So when both the numerator and denominator are made 0, um, you don't have you don't necessarily have to have a vertical asymptote um, if you hit trace then you can put in numbers if you put in four you notice that there's no y value so again we're asking what are we tending to as my x value gets closer to four not what is the output at four that's why it's important um, we can't always just plug it in so here when we plug in three we're at 29 uh, plug in 3.9 we're at 39.8 plug in uh, 3.99 we're at 40.88 uh, plug in um, 3.999 and you're at 40.988 you see that you keep going up 
but it's not without bound. We seem to be bounded. If we come up on the other side, 5, then we're at 53, 4.1. We're at 42.2, uh, 4.01, 41.12, 4.03, 41.012. It appears as if we're approaching 41, right? Um, now, so that was kind of hard to see from the graph, um, but once we started doing the trace and plugging in values, it appears as if we're getting closer to 41. Um, this is the, it, can we do this analytically, right? And why does this look like a line? Okay. So let's come over here, and uh, let me go back to window. Why does this look like a line? Sorry about that, I got lost a little bit. So let me go back. So again, here's where I'm going to use what I told you. Um, for a polynomial function, x equals a is a zero, implies the polynomial has a factor of x minus a. So when we plugged in the four into the numerator, um, we got a uh, value of zero. So what that means is that this numerator has a factor of x minus four. And to figure out how it factors, well, since we have a trinomial and one of the binomials is x minus four, then the x times whatever goes here has to give me 12x squared. So there's only one choice for that, 12x. And then because um, we end up with a plus 28, then the minus 4 times whatever goes here has to give me plus 28. So that has to be minus 7. And then um, you might be asking, well, what about the 55x? Well, when I multiply uh, these two together, I get minus 48x. And when I multiply these two together, I get... Uh, minus 7x, and when I combine those, I get the minus 55x. That has to work, right? Because x minus 4 has to be a factor. Okay. And the bottom is already x minus 4. Uh, one of the things I'm going to grade is your proper use of the notation. I want to evaluate this limit. I haven't evaluated this limit. I haven't done that. All I've done is rewritten the numerator in factor form doesn't change anything and I haven't evaluated this limit so this still needs to be there the limit is x squared to four. now um, whatever number I choose to plug in for x 5 10 uh, whatever number I choose to plug in for x this factor right here will be the same as this factor right here um, and then they will cancel out and so the final answer, the simplified answer, will only come from this. Now, um, when I'm plugging in, when I'm asking to take a limit, um, I'm not asking what do I get out when I put in four. I'm asking what do I get, uh, what, what, what do my outputs tend to? Okay, so um, this expression here, all of this right here, when I plug in four, uh, it's not defined. I get 0 over 0, which is not defined. But after I cancel it out, now I'm looking at this limit. 
limit as x goes to 4 of 12x minus 7. Still haven't taken the limit, so I just write it right there. All I did is simplify this expression by canceling out these x minus 4s, and I have this limit. Now, this is just a simple polynomial function that I can calculate my limit by just plugging it in. 12 times 4 is 48. 48 minus 7 is 48. Okay. Now, let's look at this expression, 12x minus 7. under the graphing calculator. I hit the wrong button. Um, so let's look at the graphing calculator. And we want to look at the expression uh, 12x minus 7. So we'll go to y equals. And um, I'll come over here and put in the expression 12x minus 7. All right, now, um, let me change my window and let me go from negative 11 negative 11 and the reason why I did that is so that it graphs both of them. All right, so when you go to y equals the original one is the blue line the um, a uh, cleaned up version is the red line and it'll graph both of them. There's the blue and what you can see is the red goes right over it. The reason why the red goes right over it is because um, it's the same thing except when x is 4. But when I take a limit, I'm not asking what the output is at that number. I'm asking what it's tending to, right? And since they're the same graph, they tend to the same thing although the original function is not defined. So when I hit trace, and I put in uh, 4, and then I hit enter, it does not give me a y value. Uh, but when I use the down arrow, and I put in 4, it, uh, so for the line, 12x minus 7, it tends towards 41. That's your limit. They have the same graph, they're tending towards the same thing. So let's come back over here. So what do we get from this uh, problem? When you go to do your homework, the very first thing you should do when you're finding a limit, plug it in. If you end up with uh, a, a perfectly defined number, zero over uh, 25 like we did in the previous example, that is your answer, move on. When you end up with zero over zero, what that's going to tell you is that there is some manipulation, some rearrangement that you can do so that um, you can rewrite your expression so you can make it more conducive to evaluating by simply substituting in. For rational functions where you have a polynomial and a polynomial, what that is going to mean is you're going to factor and cancel out. Right? So, when you're, so what you're going to do here is you're going to factor uh, the numerator and the denominator, cancel that out, that leaves behind the expression 12x minus 7, and what this equals means is that the limit, the, 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 the limit uh, for this function here is the same as the limit for this function. The original one we cannot get by plugging in, but the second, but the simplified version, uh, we can, right? Now, what that should really mean about your graph is um, when you looked at your graph, um, I can't write on the computer, but when you looked at on the calculator, but when you looked at your graph, it looked like this, right? And then at four, um, if you followed it on the calculator, if you were able to follow it, it would come over here and there'd be 41. But this is an inaccurate graph of your original function because uh, you're not allowed to put in four. So what you are, what you really should have right here is a hole. You should not have a point there. And so when I see your drawings, I expect your drawings to have holes where your function is not defined. Um, 
asymptotes where your limit is tending to infinity and you know you need to include the holes not just the line this is not a line this is a line with a hole in it right so this would be um, y equals uh, 12 x squared minus 55 x plus 28 all divided by x minus 4 and if you just drew right over it um, then there is no hole there that would be uh, y equals 12 x minus 7 there's no hole at 4 at 4 the output is uh, 41 and um, that has no hole in it. Okay. That's what's going on there. So go ahead and pause the video and try that one. Right. So go ahead and try this problem, pause the video. So the um, very first thing you should do is plug it in. And when you plug it in, um, what you get is 9 plus 6 minus 15, 15 minus 15, 0. 9 minus 18 plus 9, um, 18 minus 18 is 0. Can't get the answer by just plugging it in because you end up with a 0 in the denominator. That will never be defined. So but we do get zero divided by zero. So that tells me that there is some uh, simplification that I can do, some rearrangement so that uh, uh, make this problem a little easier. Again, with rational functions, what this means is we're going to factor. And again, three makes everything zero. So both the numerator and the denominator have a uh, factor of x minus three. And then for the denominator, I'm sorry, for the numerator, then this will be um, to get the x squared, you need x. And to get the minus 15, you need plus 5. And in the denominator, it's x minus 3. To get the x squared, you need x. To get the minus, I'm sorry, to get the plus 9, you need minus 3. And now, you can cancel these out. Okay. And um, so now, um, we cancel it out. Now we try to plug in. When we plug in now, we get 8 over 0. So over here, we'll get 8. And over here, we'll get 0. And again, um, so we don't get a numeric answer. But we're not getting zero in the numerator. And since we're not getting zero in the numerator, there is no simplifying to do. And again, what we saw earlier was that if the bottom was, I'm sorry, if the numerator was one and the bottom was tending towards zero, you were going to have an asymptote. Well, now the top is tending towards eight and the bottom is tending towards zero. So um, you still have an asymptote, right? And so um, what I, the work I expect to see is I expect to see either a table or a graph. Don't expect you to be able to graph that in your head. That's why you have a calculator. So what we're going to do, x plus 5 divided by x minus 3, go to the calculator and go to y equals. Get rid of that and get rid of that. parentheses and go to zoom hit 6 and again we're asking what is our output tending to as x goes to 3 
right? So then what I expect you to do is I expect you to copy this graph. Doesn't have to be pretty, um, but it, it just has to display the appropriate information. So what we saw there, um, is a graph that looked like this. There was three. The graph was doing that, and then up here it was doing that. And you can see that over here it's going to negative infinity, right? As you walk, getting closer and closer to an x value of three on this side, you're decreasing without bound. You have a vertical asymptote on the right. You're over here getting increasing without bound, so you're not um, going to one of the infinities or the other you're going to both on one on one side one on the other so what I expect you to write here is does not exist and here's the work that I expect to see with that. okay now there was a problem that I somehow cut out this was not the problem I was expecting to do so let me go ahead and fix that um, apologize for that let me come over here that this is the one that I wanted to do. I'm go ahead and stick that in here real quick. This is on your class notes. I just forgot to put it here. Okay, so go ahead and take a moment to uh, pause the video and try this part. Okay, so <laughs> what you get in the numerator, first thing you should always do is plug it in, you get 9 minus 9, um, 0. In the denominator, you get 6 times 9, uh, plus 13 times negative 3, minus 15, which is 72 minus 69, sorry, minus 39. 6 times 9 is not 72, 54. That's what happens when you try to do things too quickly. Uh, 6 times 9 is 54, and minus 39, and minus 15. And so then you can see the minus 39 and the minus 15 make uh, 54, minus 54, and the plus 54, you get 0. So you get 0 over 0. Okay. So, 0 over 0, not good. So then, but that does tell me something. It tells me that they're both, so we're going to simplify, rewrite this expression. Haven't taken the limit, so I expect you to continue to write the limit as x goes to negative 3. I haven't taken the limit. All I'm doing is rewriting my expression in a manner that makes it more uh, conducive to a substitution. Right? So, when I plug in the negative, I'm sorry, when uh, negative 3 made it 0, so x minus negative 3, or x plus 3, has to be a factor. Once x plus 3 is a factor, well then, uh, the other factor has to be x minus 3. Um, notice that you have x plus 3 and x minus 3, when the first terms are the same, and the second terms are opposites, those are called conjugates, so that's going to come up in a little bit, and when you multiply conjugates, you end up with the difference of two squares. You don't have a middle term over here. That's how that factors. In the denominator, again, um, um, to factor, you can use the fact that when you plugged in negative 3, it made this 0. So then x plus 3 has to be a factor. And so then to get the second factor, well then the x times the 6x um, is what's going to give you 6x squared. And the plus 3 times the minus 5 is what's going to give you the minus 15. Now, the, the 13x comes from multiplying these two together, 18x, multiplying these two together, minus 5x, adding those, and you get your plus 13x. Okay. Now, these are the same factors, so they go away. So now, 
and the limit of your original expression is the same as the limit as x goes to negative 3 haven't taken the limit yet I'm just simplifying it and my simplified expression is x minus 3 over 6x minus 5 and we can now calculate this limit easily enough because now we can substitute in the negative 3 and end up with negative 6 divided by um, negative 18, negative 23. Now, um, a pet peeve of mine is for people to not simplify their fractions. So I'd hate for you to do all the algebra and the calculus correct and lose a point for the arithmetic. A negative divided by a negative is a positive, and so I expect you to simplify your fractions, and this is a positive 6 over 23. And this again is why we don't want to um, find limits by just making tables or just making graphs or tables and graphs because uh, the exact value of this 6 over 23 would be difficult to get out of uh, a table or a graph. But um, by uh, analytically, by doing this algebraically, um, not so bad. Okay. Well, let's move on to this one. I um, don't know why I use so many threes. Um, I have to change this. Um, but we've taken the limit as x goes to 3 again. And so again, we get uh, 27 minus 9 minus 6 minus 12. Uh, 27 minus 9 is... Uh, 18. 18 minus 6 is 12. 12 minus 12 is 0. So that goes away. In the bottom, we get 27. Uh, 2 times 9 is um, 18. And then minus 6, minus 3. Uh, 6 and 18 is 24, and 3 is 27. 27 minus 27 is 0. 0 over 0. Can't just plug it in. Right? But again, um, 3 is a 0, so that should let us know that x minus 3 is a factor. So we have the limit as x goes to 3 of, we know that the top factors is x minus 3 times something. Same thing with the bottom, x minus 3 times something. But we don't know what that something is, and because this is not a trinomial, a quadratic trinomial, um, it's not as easy as it was before. So if you uh, just took pre-calculus and you know synthetic division, you can use synthetic division on this. I'm not going to go over synthetic division because we are not going to use it enough to warrant me uh, going over it. Um, what will work for everything, synthetic division only works when you're dividing by uh, factors of x minus a. Um, and what works for everything is long division. So for long division, um, it's just the same long division that you did in um, elementary school. Except instead of using uh, big numbers, you're using polynomials. The x minus 3 goes out here. And the uh, x cubed minus x squared minus 2x minus 12 goes in here. And then just like you did in elementary school, you're going to take the 1 in front into the 1 in front. And what I mean by that is uh, x times what will give me x cubed. And of course, that's x squared. Then you multiply the x squared by the entire x minus 3, which gives you x cubed minus 3 x squared. And then you subtract. Uh, but to subtract, it's easier if instead you add the opposite. And the opposite, you just distribute the minus and you end up with a negative x cubed plus 3x squared. And when you add those, you just get x squared minus 2x minus 12. Okay. And then again, the one in front into the one in front, x times what will give me x squared. So you add another x and you multiply x squared minus 3x. Then you subtract, um, but to subtract again, it's easier if we add 
the opposite of x squared minus 3x, which is negative x squared plus 3x. And then you end up with an x minus minus x squared minus 2x minus 12 and then ooh, there's my mistake um, when I added the uh, 3x squared and the minus x squared I got x squared but it's really 2x squared and so then this should be 2x and so then 2 times 2x times x is 2x squared and then this should be um, 6x and then 6x minus 2x is 4x minus 12 and so then the last one the one in front to the one in front is 4 and so then you get 4x minus 12 and now when you subtract they're the same so you get 0 okay so um, that's how you do that and so then your answer up here is x squared plus 2x plus 4 Um, you know that x minus 3 has to be a factor, so that means your final answer here should be 0. If it's not 0, it's not a factor. I wasn't going to get 0, so I know I made a mistake. I went back to find my mistake, and then I fixed it. Okay, so you should pause the video um, and make sure that you can figure out how to figure out this trinomial. Right? So go ahead and do that. Pause the video. Okay, so I erase that. Now let's figure out our, our other factor. Um, we're dividing by x minus 3, but now we're dividing into the denominator x cubed minus 2x squared minus 2x minus 3. And so again, the one in front into the one in front, x squared, and so you get x cubed minus 3x squared. And then um, subtract. So now you do get just x squared minus 2x minus 3. And then the one in front into the one in front. So now you do get just x. And you get x squared uh, minus 3x. And then you subtract. Um, and then this becomes x minus 3 plus 1. So you get x squared plus x plus one. Now the x minus 3's cancel out. Now you are free to substitute in um, because in the denominator you get 9 plus 3 plus 1, which is not 0, so they're good. In the numerator you get 9 plus 6 plus 4. And so you get 19 divided by 13. And we are done with this one. Let us move on. Okay, so um, again, very first thing you should do is plug in. Um, fairly intuitive that um, the numerator should go to zero, but also the denominator goes to zero. Because we have zero over zero, that tells us that we have some work to do, that we can't just plug in. Okay, so but what work do we do? Um, so there are some standard tricks that you have to know. And so um, just from experience, you, you figure out these tricks. And when you see binomials like this, uh, 2 minus the square root of y, um, you should think uh, to multiply the numerator and denominator by the conjugate. Right? So this is a fraction. And what you learned in arithmetic is that you can change the way the fraction looks by multiplying the numerator and denominator by the same number. If we use the conjugate of this expression, and the conjugate of this expression is 2 plus the square root of y, and we can't just multiply the bottom by that, so 2 plus the square root of y, then um, now it, what this, these two are conjugates, so we want to expand that. I haven't taken the limit, so you need to keep writing. The limit is y goes to 4. I'm going to take points off if you don't use the notation correctly. 
Um, so make sure that you use, learn to use the notation correctly. Now, uh, we use these, these two are conjugates, we should expand that. And when that expands, you get the first one squared, 4, minus the second one squared, y. In the numerator, um, those are not conjugates, and we should um, so we should not expand that, because what we see is that we see this factor of 4 minus y, and if we expand it, then we won't be able to clean up. Our goal is to get rid of something so that we can then plug in. And by doing this, then we can get rid of the 4 minus y's, and now we can plug in. And when we plug in, um, we get 2 plus the square root of 4, which is 4. So the outputs here will tend to 4. Okay, so what you have here is called a piecewise defined function. You should have seen these in pre-calculus. You should understand what this, how this function is defined. It's called a piecewise defined function because it's defined in pieces. Right? Um, so for values less than zero, right, your function is this line, t minus 2. Now, t minus 2 is a line, so your input axis is t, and your output axis is uh, y, we just call that y. Okay? Um, and so if I was going to graph y, uh, y equals t minus 2, since that's a line, all I need is two points. And typically, any two points will do. But I'm not looking at the whole line, I'm just looking at uh, the line uh, when t is less than 0. So I'm going to start at 0. And when I put in 0, I get negative 2. So at 0, we're negative 2. And then we're only using numbers less than 0. So at negative 4, at negative 4 minus 2, I get negative 6. But when I go to the point 0, negative 2, that point is not on my graph. I should put a hole there. And so then my graph at negative 4, I get negative 6. So that should be about right here. The graph is a line starting from this hole and moving forward. There we go. Then when we go to graph t squared, you should know what that is. Uh, that's a parabola. Um, but again, and, uh, and you're only looking at that graph, only looking at that parabola uh, for t values from 0 to 2. So then you should make another table for that one. 0 t, I'm sorry, t, t squared. And, but you only should only use 0, 1, and 2, and 0, 1, and 4. And um, now, these are included here. It's a, a, a conditional inequality. It could be less than or equal to 0, and it could be less than or equal to 2. So at 0, that point really is on the graph. This makes it a function. When your input is zero, this is not your output. This one up here is. Okay, so at two you get, I'm sorry, at one you get one. That point is on my graph. And then at two I get four. That point is also on my graph. And so I get that, but the graph ends at this point. It's just three different pieces. And then the, for the last piece, um, you have t to t. So then um, t to t, um, again, but you're not looking, that's a line, but you're not looking at the whole line. You're only looking at it when t is greater than 2. And so then when t is greater than 2, because we can plug in 2 into the formula, that should be one point on your table. So you put 2 over here, we'll get 4. Okay, um, and then um, uh, to the right of 2, because it says t is bigger than 2, we'll use 4, and then we'll get 8. Okay. So let me graph that part in blue. So now at 2, 4, that coincides with this point, but that's not on my second formula. So I should put a hole there, but it's actually filled in by the second formula. 
and then uh, from that from four I get at four I get eight and the graph is a line. So there we go. Okay, so <coughs> This part of the graph is this right here. This part of the graph is this right here. And this part of the graph is this third part right here. And that's what's going on there. Okay, so now we have a graph. Um, and we're being asked to find the limit as t goes to zero. Now again, it does not say from the right or the left. So um, you have to look at it from both directions. So to look at it from both directions, on the left you're coming in and it looks like you're going to negative 2. Okay, but on the right you, you look like, yeah, you, you, you come in on the right and it looks like it's going to 0. Those are two different things so the limit does not exist. You, you can get that from the graph. But I want you to do this analytically. So to do it analytically um, because zero is a point where you change formulas, zero is an input at where you change formulas, then what you need to do is you need to uh, take the limit as uh, t goes to zero from the left, and um, this is of g of t. Now, um, Because we're coming in from the left, that means we're only using values that are less than zero. And so then we don't have to write g of t, we can write what the formula is. The formula is t minus two. So this is the limit as t goes to zero from the left of t minus two. That's a simple polynomial expression. We can plug it in, we get negative two. This graph right here was drawn using this formula. So as we walk getting closer and closer to an x value of 0 using this formula, we're going to get to this negative 2. So that's our limit. But that's our limit from the left. The limit as t goes to 0 from the right of g of t, we now use the other formula. So this becomes the limit as t goes to 0 from the right of t squared. We only want values that are bigger than 0, but we can keep them close enough to to zero that, that that we only use this formula because this formula works between zero and two um, so we don't want to try values like three or four because that's not very close to zero so as long as we stay uh, really close to zero we're just going to use the t squared formula when you get zero so when you're walking over here towards the zero on the right of zero you're getting to this y uh, to this uh, t value of zero because this was generated using the t squared formula and since you have two different numbers, this does not exist. Okay. Uh, for this one, uh, for the limit as t goes to 1, you should try to do that one on your own. Pause the video. Okay. So after you come back, right? So um, we're going to the limit as t goes to 1. So we want to stay really close to 1. Um, so if we're staying really close to 1, um, we could always just be using this formula. So we can replace this with the limit as t goes to 1 of t squared, because that's the formula we're going to use. And then um, we find this limit just by plugging it in. We plug it in, we get 1. So as we walk, getting closer and closer, to uh, 1, we're getting closer and closer to a y value of 1. No big deal there. Okay, now I uh, pause the video and do the third one. I take the limit as t goes to 2 of g of t. Make sure that you do everything correctly. Now for the second one, we only needed to use one formula because we could keep all our values close enough to 1 that they would fall in this interval from 0 to 2. But now we want to take the limit as t goes to 2, and that 2 is where it switches formulas. So here again, we have to take the limit as t goes to 2 from the left, and the limit as t goes to 2 from the right. When we're on the left, 
and we are going to use the t squared formula. So we'll have the limit as t goes to 2 from the left of t squared. And we can plug that in, and we get 4. And um, again, that was walking along this parabola, you were getting closer and closer to the y value of 4. Now the limit as t goes to 2 from the right, um, you're using numbers that are bigger than 2, so you're going to use the formula 2t. And there then, um, you get, uh, uh, you can just plug it in, sorry, didn't use my correct notation. So the limit as t goes to 2 from the right of 2t. And so then that is again, plug it in and you get 4. Because you're walking along this line and both the line and the parabola were going to the same point as you got closer and closer to a t value of 2. Okay. And since you're, go since you're going to the same value, your limit is not 4. Very good. So another piecewise defined function. Pause the video and find the limit as x goes to negative 3 of f of x. Okay, so if we look at this strictly algebraically, we want to find the limit as x goes to uh, negative 3 and, uh, of x squared minus 9 over x plus 3. First thing we do is plug it in. When we plug it in, we get 0 over 0. So then this becomes the limit as x goes to um, negative 3 of x plus 3 times x minus 3 over x plus 3. The x plus 3s go away and you get negative 6. Okay, now again, once these go away, all we're left with is this formula x minus 3. So again, what that means is that the equation y equals x squared minus 9 over x plus 3 is the same thing as the equation um, x minus 3, except x cannot equal negative 3. And so again, this expression y equals x minus 3, that's just a line. The slope is 1, and its y-intercept is negative 3, so y-intercept is there, and the slope is a 1. But we're not allowed to use negative 3. When we put in negative 3 into this formula, we get negative 6. And that's negative 3. That's negative 6. And so then that point is not on there. And your graph should have a hole in it. And so then, there you go. And there you go. And this is y equals x squared minus 9 over x plus 3. As we walk getting closer and closer to an x value of negative 3, your y value gets closer and closer to a uh, y value of negative 6. Right? That's the top part. The second part of your definition is it's going to be k when x is negative 3. So only for the value negative 3, it's the constant function k. And so then the second part is it says find k so that f of negative 3 is equal to the limit. Well, we know what this is. This is negative 6. So we want f of negative 3 to equal negative 6. Right? So we want k to equal negative 6. And what you are doing there is your line had a hole in it, you just filled it in. Right? That's what you just did. And now you have the complete line. So a simple formula for this piecewise defined function, x squared minus 9 over x plus 3, when x does not equal negative 3, and then negative 6, when x does equal negative 3. This is just the line x minus 3.
that and there is your homework for this section um, this will be due next week be sure to get that done thank you very much have a good night